Good evening. Welcome to the National Press Club, the place where news happens. My name is Emily Wilkins. I have the honor of being the 117th president here at the National Press Club, and I'm also a correspondent for CNBC here in Washington. Thank you guys so much for joining us for our event this evening, our headliners book event with Craig Unger, the author of Den of Spies, Reagan, Carter, and the Secret History of Treason That Stole the White House. And thanks to those of you who are joining our discussion, uh, either live or by tuning in on C-SPAN television and radio. We're happy to accept questions from the audience. We will take as many as time permits. If you'd like to submit a question, please email headliners at press.org. That's H-E-A-D-L-I-N-E-R-S at press.org. Write spies in the subject line. And of course, if you are in the room with us, you have cards at your seat. Please feel free to write questions on those. Um, I usually have you hand them to someone and then come up here and hand them to me. We might have to just have you come up here and hand them to me. So don't be shy. I don't fight often. Um, all right. Well, it's just 14 days until the general election. We are braced for what has become an expectation, the October surprise. But in 1980, as incumbent President Jimmy Carter attempted to fend off a challenge from Republican governor of California, Ronald Reagan, the term for a late-breaking revelation that would turn an election on its head had yet to be coined by Reagan's campaign manager, William Casey. Our guest today, Craig Unger, a best-selling author and the former editor-in-chief of Boston Magazine, takes us back to that time with, this invest with his investigation into the alleged collusion between Reagan's 1980 presidential campaign and Iran to delay, until after the election, the release of 52 American hostages, a crisis that loomed large over the Carter administration as a foreign policy failure. Mr. Unger spent more than 30 years trying to unravel the threads of this shadow foreign policy while enduring hostility from his fellow reporters and dismissal as a conspiracy theorist from the political establishment. While he chased his white whale, he continued to build a career as an investigative journalist and as a contributing editor for Vanity Fair, where he covered national security and foreign affairs. His work has appeared in many other publications, including New York Magazine, The New Yorker, The Squire, The Guardian, The New York Times, Washington Post, and The New Republic. We are eager to uh, welcome you, Craig, here to the National Press Club, and to finally hear how you got your story. And please join me in a warm National Press Club welcome for Craig Unger. And Craig, I, I will give you the floor now for any remarks you want to make. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, you know, I, I've written six books on the Republican Party's assault on democracy. This one was different. It was personal. And when I started investigative journalism, one of the first things you learn is, it's not personal. Don't write about yourself. And this, I, I felt I had to because it's something I did pursue on and off for more than 30 years. And in many cases, I was a, a very reluctant, and I, I had a front row seat, and I uh, was a reluctant participant in what was going on, and I, I, I saw what I thought was some of the great, uh, one of the great disgraces of our, of, our uh, of the media in covering this up. Um, the October surprise, the phrase October surprise wasn't known back then. I started on this in, in uh, April of 1991. And it, it started out, as you said, with the 1980 presidential campaign. The phrase was used then. But it was started, uh, the, the Republicans tried to use it uh, to defuse what they saw as Jimmy Carter getting the hostages released just before the election. Mm. The great scandal was they they sort of twisted it and turned it on its ass, and they uh, put together a plot to keep uh, Carter from doing that. Um, uh, to me, it was something that bordered on treason. It, it, it's often been what what happened uh, during the October surprise has often been called a violation of the Logan Act, which is a an obscure law that, it, that is often cited but almost never used, and it's designed to prohibit unauthorized citizens who are not part of the government from hijacking American foreign policy, interfering with our government, and using it to their own advantage. And in this case, the Republicans were using it uh, very much to their partisan advantage. The, the way it took place back in 1980 was sort of extraordinary, and I, I think it was best... Uh, 
characterized by the onion. What took place was both in plain sight, but no one saw it. And uh, The Onion, a satirical magazine, uh, had an end of the century book in which they referred to the, event, the events uh, of the October Surprise. And they focused on the inauguration day for Ronald Reagan. And the headline they had was Ronald Reagan uh, inaugurated, advises America not to put two and two together. And if you saw it happen, I mean, it really was an extraordinary, I, I, I wish I could display it, the front page of the New York Times that day, but it was Reagan is inaugurated and Hasse's is released. You knew Reagan could not possibly have, have negotiated the release as president because he'd only been on the podium for three minutes uh, in full view of us. And yet the Iranians wouldn't have released the hostages without having had some contact with his administration. So it, it seemed on, on, really just sort of obvious from a logical point of view, yet it was entirely obscured. Um, I really didn't get into it until April of 1991. I, I wasn't the first by any means. Uh, what, what tipped me off was a, was a very memorable op-ed piece in the New York Times by Gary Sick. It was titled, uh, The Election Story of the Decade. And Gary had been on Jimmy Carter's National Security Council. He was the point man for Iran, so he was directly involved in it on a regular basis. But it was not until many years later that he began to put it all together. And he began to realize that some of the key intermediaries who, were, who had approached the Carter administration, there were two brothers, Cyrus and Tom Sheet Hashemi, and then come to the Carter administration and said, look, uh, we're Iranian businessmen, uh, we can help you out. We know some of the key people now that the Iranian revolution has taken place. And uh, the Carter administration did not realize they were really double agents who were secretly working for the Republicans. Um, I, I, as soon as I saw that uh, piece in the New York Times, I was writing for Esquire magazine at the time, I got in touch with my editor, and I spent about four months, I interviewed over 150 people, and I put together a 10,000 word narrative uh, that basically fleshed out what I'd read in the, in the, uh, in the Times op-ed piece. I, I tried to corroborate or refute any of the assertions there. Uh, and to my astonishment, it, 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 there was quite a lot of there were quite a lot of Republicans who were willing to talk to me and told me that they, they thought it had happened as well. Uh, the story ran in I think it was the October issue of Esquire. It was well received, and I was immediately hired by Newsweek, and that is where things went south. And to me, what happened at Newsweek was one of the most disgraceful episodes perhaps in the history of the American press. I, I, I think the October surprise uh, has, has sort of been swept under the rug in terms of its historical importance. And uh, one of my sources back then was Elliot Richardson, who of course had been Attorney General in the Nixon administration. To me, Elliot Richardson once was the moral hero of Watergate. He resigned his cabinet post, when Nixon tried to get him to fire the special prosecutor, but rather than do that, Richardson resigned and the, the uh, uh, investigation proceeded and it led to Nixon being forced out of office. And it turned out uh, Elliot Richardson was very well informed by, about the October surprise as well, and when I was interviewing him, he told me uh, Watergate was a garden party compared to the October surprise. Mm -hmm. And yet there I was at Newsweek, uh, which was owned by the Washington Post. And of course, the Washington Post uh, uncovered wa uh, Watergate. They, they, that's where they did their great, greatest work. And yet, when I got to the Washington to, to Newsweek, they did a 180 and they covered it up. And I was sort of agog about it. And I can go more into more details if people wa want to. But um, I, I was sort of, uh, after three months there, uh, to, to my astonishment, it was, what was so astonishing about what Newsweek did is they ran three articles. 
week after week, and they said the October spies didn't happen, the October spies didn't happen, the October spies didn't happen. And if there are news people in the audience, uh, news is when something happens. When something doesn't happen, you don't write that three times in a row. And something was going on, and I was trying to figure it out. Um, I, you know, I, I think uh, what I learned during this period set me off for going on a much uh, longer, and there were, there were several things I learned. One was that this could not have taken place without Israel's help, and that Israel was an active partner in it. And when you put it all together, I mean, the reason for that was uh, Israel wanted Iran armed because they feared that Iraq was attacking Iran, and if Iraq were to win and take over all the oil in the Middle East, that would be devastating to Israel. Uh, Israel also happened to have a lot of spare parts uh, from American weapons, because they were armed by, by the United States, just as Iran had been under the, the Shah. So Iran had all these F-4 fighter jets, uh, C-130 cargo planes, and so forth, but they would run on spare parts for them, on tires and so forth. Israel was the way to get them. And Israel secretly united with the Reagan-Bush campaign uh, to set up secret meetings and make sure this happened. And, and I, I think the lesson from that is really uh, uh, a, an important part of history that's been swept under the rug because here you have Israel, which is supposedly our strongest ally in the Middle East and we're their greatest patron. But they were working on a covert operation to sabotage an American presidential election. Huh. And if you print that, you're going to get some pushback. And I got horrific pushback. And among other things, uh, I was fired from Newsweek. I was sued for $10 million. And for a while there, I was just sort of twisting in the wind, not knowing, and I knew I had to rebuild my, my career. Can I ask who, who sued? Uh, Bud McFarlane was uh, Reagan's national security advisor. He sued me for $10 million. It was a nuisance suit. I won easily. He appealed. Uh, I won at the appellate court. He appealed to the United States Supreme Court, and they uh, refused to take the case. Uh, but, it, you know, even when you win easily like that and your expenses, your legal expenses are covered by the publisher, they were, it's still just not a good thing. And it kept me out of work for a couple of years there, and it was not good for my career. You don't want to get sued. Um, um, and the other thing I learned that was very important was at the head of the operation was a wonderful, wonderful character named Bill Casey who I think is one of the most extraordinary people, probably uh, the greatest spy in America, in American history, maybe. Uh, he had uh, done extraordinary work in World War II against the Nazis. Unfortunately, he started using similar tactics against the Democrats. Um, and uh, he was, uh, you know, he was a complete slob. People, he, he, I, I, I describe him as a, as a cross between James Bond and Mr. Magoo. <laughs> and he mumbled when he talked. That was one of his uh, nicknames. Uh, Ronald Reagan famously said, uh, you know, I can't understand a word Bill Casey says. And I can ask him to repeat himself once. I can ask twice, but you can't ask a third time. So I just nod <laughs> and smile. And that's all that happens. And you get the sense that uh, Casey may or may not have divulged exactly what was going on, or at least that in broad terms. Um, but Reagan wasn't probing at all and not trying to get to the bottom of things. Um, and um, uh, so after I was fired, I was sort of left twisting in the wind and uh, trying to rebuild my career. And uh, I did not do what I do alone. And I... I became friendly with a guy named Bob Perry, who did probably more than anyone to pursue the October surprise. Uh, but what I later realized is he had been at Newsweek before me, and they didn't want to cover this. Uh, Bob had uh, done award-winning reporting about uh, the Iran-Contra scandal, and uh, as he pursued the October surprise, it became increasingly clear 
that the October surprise was really the origin story for Iran-Contra. Um, that most people thought Iran-Contra had started around 1984, but in fact, uh, the October surprise were the origin. It's where there was a, a channel, an orange channel to Israel, and uh, Bob went on to discover some very important things about the October surprise. Uh, one is he was able to prove that Bill Casey really was in Madrid during the uh, summer of 1980 at meetings at which the October surprise uh, was launched. And perhaps even more important, he got, and, and that to me sort of made it virtually impossible to deny the October surprise. It didn't, he, he wrote about it on his website in a book called Trick or Treason, but um, uh, it didn't get as much traction as it should have in the American press. And he also discovered uh, what he called the X-Files. And there were congressional investigations into the October surprise, but one uh, measure of how the Democrats really were lapdogs in that period is they'd taken a lot of documents and they put them in cardboard boxes and they stored them in an abandoned ladies' room. And uh, Bob Perry found them many years later under the tampon dispenser. And this is where I think you find some of the most incriminating documents that really prove the October surprise. It includes uh, um, reports from the KGB that, that, that the KGB furnished Congress, but that were not released in, in the a congressional report, and a lot of other material as well. Um, so, uh, I don't know. That, no, that gives, I think, a really good sort of overview of how this book came to be and sort of how you got involved. I, I think the, the one question I kind of want to ask off the top, given that you've sort of just walked us through everything, why do you think this story was the one that stuck with you? Because certainly you have done a lot over your career. Uh, I know that you've worked on this on and off. What kept you coming back to it and deciding to continue with this story, even though you'd gotten so much pushback? Because I think this was uh, a hugely important in, in American history. This is the birth of modern conservatism, right? The Reagan administration, the birth of the Reagan era. And at its, at its foundation was what some call a treasonous covert operation that sabotaged American presidential uh, uh uh, that sabotaged our foreign policy and sabotaged the election. And if we let that go, if we don't push back at that, it's going to happen again and again and again. And that's why I think the book is so important today. You know, we hear a lot about the October surprise when Bob Woodward says that, uh, that Trump has had seven contacts with Vladimir Putin. What's going on there? Is he making foreign policy without us? He's also doing it with Bibi Netanyahu. Uh, no, 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 no. We have one president at a time, and if we let that slide, uh, really, I think our democracy is lost, and I think that's what, what's happening now in a much more overt way. It was extraordinarily covert back then. Uh, it, it was, uh, uh, you know, I, I finally got in touch with one of, Bill Casey had a, a secret network, a secret intelligence network, and I finally sort of got people to talk to me from it. I, there was a guy named uh, Robert Sensi, and I tried to get him to talk in 1991, and he wouldn't talk to me. 33 years later, he talked to me. And he told me how he helped, he traveled with KC, setting up some of these, these meetings with the Iranians in Madrid. And Casey, he said, uh, wore a yellow wig. He traveled under with a phony passport under the name of Daniel O'Neill. Uh, and he gave me all the details on how he set up these meetings and why they were so important. Similarly, Casey was meeting with uh, uh, illegal arms dealers who sold to Iran. Uh, there was a South African named Dirk Stopford. He had, uh, it, uh, you know, a lot of other people who were who were. He, he would go in a dozen different directions at, at, at a time. No one knew everything he was doing. It was always compartmentalized. And uh, 
He mumbled a lot. <laughs> yeah. Was there, for some of these individuals that you spoke with who, you know, wouldn't speak with you at the time but are now kind of reflecting on this 30 years later, was there any sense of how did they view what they had done? Was there regret? Was there a concern? Did they try and justify it to you in some way? Well, some did. They genuinely hated Jimmy Carter, and, and I think you need a, a big uh, a sense of history to understand really the importance of Iran because the CIA had gone, you know, in, in the post-war era was doing coup d'etats and assassinations all over the world. And uh, in, in Guatemala and Syria, uh, Iran, uh, Vietnam, the Dominican Republic. The one in Iran was certainly one of the most important because the CIA had installed the Shah in 1953. And in so doing, uh, one is that they sort of ended the possibility of secular democracy uh, in Iran. Uh, they installed the Shah. The previous, the, uh, uh, the Prime Minister Mossadegh, who, the, who they ousted, I was a secular Democrat. His great crime was that he wanted to nationalize the oil industry, and the West didn't want any part of that. We were getting cheap. We'd been getting cheap oil for the entire Western world uh, from 1953 to 79. Suddenly, with the Iranian re Revolution, it was over. And these old line C CIA officers—they were hawks, and they wanted it back. And they felt uh, Jimmy Carter had just pissed away Iran and our dominance in the Middle East. Yeah. So for they, a lot of them saw this as a lot bigger about just an election, but about more about the U.S.'s place in the world and foreign policy at, at large. Right, and oil. And oil, yeah. which it drives a lot of our policy. Yes. I, I'm really curious about some of this pushback that you got, especially from, I mean, it strikes me as very interesting that you wrote this story for Inquirer, and then Newsweek is like, great, we'll hire you, and then they suddenly don't want you to touch the story. What types of things were said to you? What were some of the concerns that were laid out? Well, one is there was a lot of disinformation going on, and, and to unravel this, you had to break into the secret arms deals that were going on. And I, you know, there, and one by one, we saw these so called super sources surface, and they would talk to various reporters and they'd give them, a, you know, an explosive bombshell of a secret arms deal in the Middle East, and it turned out to be true. Huh. And they'd do it again a second time, and it turned out to be true. And so the reporter would trust them, and then he'd explode in their face, and their reputations would go up. And uh, so I knew that even before I started working on this. But one of the key uh, figures in this was an Israeli, sort of a rogue Israeli agent named Ari ben Menashe. Bob Perry talked to him a lot. I talked to him a lot. Um, and the art world of arms dealers, you're dealing with people who are not, you know, there's, it's not a nice world, really. You can't always trust them. In fact, you should never trust them. But you should hear them out and corroborate or refute them, and that's what I tried to do. But I was, uh, in, in attacking me, they would say that I, I was gullible and I was trying uh, um, Taking these arms dealers at face value, and uh, be, you know, I, uh, and I and I was really nothing more than a gullible conspiracy theorist. In fact, I went to Israel and I talked to uh, Ari Ben Menashe's two immediate superiors, um, Yahashua Sagi, who was head of Israeli military intelligence, and his deputy Moshe Hevroni, and they both confirmed to me <laughs> that uh, Ben Menashe was. Uh, had worked for them, and he'd sort of gone rogue. I mean, the other thing I learned from that, from Yahashua Tzaki, is that he was talking uh, regularly to Bill Casey. And if you think about it, I, I mean, uh, the, uh, the, the, the people who run presidential campaigns are not supposed to be meeting with Israeli intelligence all the time. But Bill Casey was, and that was, was sort of something extraordinary. You could see where he was getting his intelligence done, and how his meeting, secret meetings were being set up, and so forth. And so, do you feel like there's been any sort of corner that's been turned on this story, on the October surprise? Is there more of a sense that it's recognized as accurate at this point, or are you still getting pushback for things like this book? 
Well, you know, I don't think it's widely accepted enough at all, and I think it really is an important part of, of history. I mean, in, in the ensuing years, I, I did go back to it again and again and again, and Bob Perry had been sort of a rival in the sense that we were, work, we were competitors working on the same story. Afterwards, we became friendly, and we started to share information. Bob sadly died, I think, about five or six years ago, and uh, his family very, very generously gave me access to his archives. And uh, there's an extraordinary amount of material, and I think it um, should put to rest any doubts about the October surprise whatsoever. And one of the most telling documents I found, and it's reproduced in my book, uh, is I bring what I think are the receipts. Uh, and there are actual documents of arms sales uh, that are uh, originated with, I mentioned these Hashemi brothers, and it originated from John C. Hashemi, who was a, working for Bill Casey, and they sent weapons, these were C, uh, spare parts for C-130 cargo planes, and uh, I ended up getting the, rec the receipts uh, went to President Bani Sadr of Iran, who then turned them over to Congress, and Congress promptly filed them in cardboard boxes underneath the tampon dispenser, where finally Bob Harry discovered them. Mm -hmm. And, but, uh, but I think these are, uh, I, I gave, showed them to various people like Gary Sick, who was on the National Security Council, and he described them as being definitive and conclusive proof uh, that Casey's operatives had been trading weapons to Iran. I know you also talk um, in the book about the 1980 Eagle Claw, Operation Eagle Claw, which of course attempted to rescue the hostages, and you wrote that it failed due to sabotage. And I know this is based well, on. Go for it. No, there are allegations, that, that, and 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 I I think it's inconclusive, but I I think there is very interesting evidence that's worth pursuing about that, and uh, also among Bob Perry's uh, documents, I found uh, uh, unpublished memoirs of a Palestinian intelligence uh, operative named uh, Mustafa Zayn. Mustafa Zayn was an important figure um, <coughs> in the world of intelligence. Uh, he uh, was a high-level intelligence operative for Yasser Arafat, and he was also the intermediary between the PLO and the CIA. So uh, he, uh, in, in his unpublished memoirs, he makes a, a very interesting case about it, I, I don't think it's conclusive, but it, it's very interesting, and I think there, uh, you know, there, it, it, it's something worth pursuing. Interesting. So that one, at least, is is kind of still yet to be determined. Yeah, there there still are some some key unanswered questions. I mean, I think another big unanswered question is there there is a lot of evidence that uh, George H. W. Bush, uh, who was president during this. Um, uh, during uh, when uh, Bob and I were investigating it back in 91 and 92, and he was running, of course, for re-election. Bill Clinton beat him back then, of course. Uh, but, uh, of course, he was part of the Reagan-Bush ticket, and he was a former CIA director, uh, and uh, he knew a lot of CIA operatives who, who, who were involved uh, with the October surprise. So. I think there are a lot of unanswered questions about uh, his role as well. Interesting. And, and I know I want to go back a bit to the misinformation. I mean, you mentioned that there was sort of a string of reporters who got burned putting out inaccurate stories because previously trustworthy source, sources turned untrustworthy. And it seems like there was, of course, which makes a lot of sense, I think, to a lot of us in this room, you don't want to put out a wrong story. You don't want to get sued. But I'm wondering at the same point, in, in a world that we live in right now that has so much misinformation and disinformation floating out there, how can we make sure that we're doing what we need to do to remain vigilant and as reporters make sure that we are putting forward what is accurate, even if there are concerns that, you know, oh, well, this sounds too conspiracy theory and, and we shouldn't run with it. Well, it's not easy, and there's no simple answer. With, with Ari Benmanashi, I was faced with this problem constantly for months, and I finally went to Israel and interviewed uh, 
the people you reported to, and it requires that kind of, uh, you know, Bob Perry also did, you know, always went the extra mile, uh, and I think you have to do it. I don't think there's any simple answer to it, um, and, and I think there's, uh, you know, now disinformation, I mean, you know, it, the amount of it is insane, and it's very hard to, uh, 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 to weed through it all, but, uh, I mean, with, with the stuff coming out for the Trump campaign these days is often ridiculous. Do you see a lot of connection between the election in 1980 and today's election? Well, yes, I do in the, in, in the sense that I, I, I think you see, uh, uh, you know, a, sab a sabotage of our elect electoral process. That's really what's been going on. And, and, and by the way, I mean, let, let's look at it in, through the long lens of history. And I want to go back to 1968, uh, because it happened then as well. And this was known as the Anna Chenault Affair. In 1968, uh, the election was between Hubert Humphrey and Richard Nixon. The Vietnam War was, uh, was going on. Lyndon Johnson was not was incumbent, but not running for re-election. But he was genuinely trying to end the Vietnam War, and it started peace talks in Paris. And uh, the Republicans' big fear was that the peace just before the election, in which case the Democrats would probably win. Uh, so Richard Nixon reached out to a woman named Anna Chenault. Uh, she uh, was a Chinese national who had married a, an American general, Claire Chenault. Uh, and she was very uh, tied in with the uh, top officials in Vietnam. And Nixon got her to go to the president of Vietnam and say, we don't want you to go to the peace talks. If you boycott the peace talks, you'll get a better deal from Nixon. And sure enough, uh, the South Vietnamese uh, did not show up at the peace talks. Uh, the Democrats had egg all over the face. It was, it was embarrassing. And Nixon won in a squeaker. Uh, and some of the key people, Casey was part of that campaign. William Casey was part of that campaign. So, uh, campaign. so was Richard Allen. And Anna Chenault, I discovered, uh, was also meeting with Bill Casey in 1980 during the October surprise of 1980. All right, so that was comparing 1980 back to, to 1968. Okay. All right, let me keep going, okay? Go for it, yeah. Okay, so Nixon was elected. He was running for re-election in 1972. He's petrified the Democrats have the goods on him because, because of what happened in 68. So he wants to get any documents or tapes they might have. And he puts together a team of burglars to break into the Brookings Institute and a residential uh, uh, office complex known as the Watergate. And there you have Watergate in 1972. Uh, so that's 68 and 72. In 1980, we have the book on um, uh, what I write about in my book today. Uh, in 2000, we have the Brooks Brothers riots in Miami, in which uh, Roger Stone uh, led a gang of, uh, uh, I guess, yeah, preppy lawyers to, to riot and disrupt the recount in such a way that it forced... Uh, um, it, it, it meant that the United States Supreme Court ended up deciding the election. And that, uh, of course, led to the ele election of George W. Bush in 2000. And uh, 2016, again, we have Donald Trump. And I, in, in two books I wrote, I wrote about his connections to Putin. But, I mean, he was doing that in the open. He was saying, uh, listen, Russia, if you're listening, Send me those emails, and they dribbled out, dribbled out, bit by bit, in the, in the New York Times, and it became a big issue that uh, really undercut uh, Hillary Clinton's campaign and led to uh, Trump's election in 2016. In 2020, we all know what was happened, and uh, we're at it again, I think, uh, in 2024 now. When you say we're at it again, I know you mentioned earlier that, that Trump has said that he has had conversations with Putin, is there something specific that you think that you can kind of see as, as being a, what happens next if Trump is elected president? You know, it took me 33 years to unravel this. <laughs> I'm not going to predict what's going to happen. I can't say everything that has happened. 
But uh, I would be stunned if there was not disinformation coming out on a massive scale uh, uh, from Russia right now. Uh, there are, you know, and, and, there, and there was uh, in 2016, in 2020, and I, I, I'd be surprised if it isn't happening again. Yeah. Uh, can I also ask, I mean, you've laid out the case for a lot of Republican presidents kind of getting involved with foreign policy before they officially become president or to, to, to have a certain impact on the election. Have Democrats ever tried this tactic? Well, not to my knowledge, and it's not just getting involved in foreign policy. I mean, this is why Trump says, what's wrong with talking to foreign leaders? Is there anything wrong with that? Uh, there is, if you're interfering with uh, American foreign policy, yes. It's very something very wrong, and, and I mean, I, I think it's so obvious, I shouldn't have to say it. Trump will cave, on the Ukrainian war, Trump will cave to Putin. He'll just say, Get, you can take Ukraine. I think that's pretty obvious, and you almost don't have to make that case. Um, so we could, yeah, see, see something like, well... But I have not seen the Democrats doing it. I, I uh, you know... Um, I know, again, we've got questions of cards around the room. I don't know if anyone's written down a question or wants to pass it up this way. Um, but happy to take your questions up here if anyone's got one. I'm guessing you're not going to write yours down. <laughs> well, I'm right there. <laughs> and they may not hear me, but uh, the point is... Uh, I forget which Democratic president was very unhappy with Jimmy Carter once he'd been president, going around talking to foreign leaders. Wait, wait, I'm sorry, I don't quite understand. You said the Democrats never uh, went over the line when they were no longer president, when Republicans were presidents. I said Carter, I think, contradicts that because Carter did talk to foreign leaders and the Democratic president, whoever it was, I think it was Obama or Clinton, were very unhappy about that. Well, I, I didn't say it was wrong to talk to foreign leaders. I'm saying to, to intervene and to... What, what Bill Casey did was he made a secret deal with Iran, and he said, we are going to violate Jimmy Carter's arms embargo. There were hostile foreign power who had Americans hostage. And, and Jimmy Carter violated the arms embargo. He was bribing Iran. And in return for bribing Iran, he wanted one thing. He wanted Iran to keep American hostages. He wanted to prolong their incarceration. I, I, don't, I haven't seen any Democrat do anything like that. Um, and, you know, I'd be surprised if... if uh, Former presidents like Obama have never had conversations with foreign leaders since. But I don't know that they uh, intervened to contradict, say, George W. Bush's foreign well, the point, policy. The point I'm making is that the sitting yeah. president was unhappy with what Carter did. I, can't, I don't know the specifics, but I know that that is a fact. Right. I, I guess I, I, I'm not familiar with that. Sorry. And we do we do have another question, and, and forgive me if, if I've, I'm not reading this one right. I'm going to do my best. Can you explain, if true, the curiously good relationship between Bill Coakley and Lyndon LaRouche? Casey. Casey. Sorry, Bill Casey and Lyndon LaRouche and his... People. Thank you. Okay. People at the time. Uh, well, the short answer is no, but I've been, I'm somewhat aware of it. And, and I, I did go back. I mean, there's no question... I've always kept a big distance from Lyndon DeRouche and his people, and I got wired. But there's no question they uh, they were wired in terms of intelligence, and there are articles that were produced that were very, very interesting. And I've talked to reporters who've written those articles, and I still don't know the answer, except that they were wired. And, and uh, I think I think intelligence operatives use them in a certain way, and I, I can't really explain it in depth. I also wanted to see if you ever got the chance to chat with President Carter at all for the book, or if you reached out to him at all. No, I, I did reach out to him, and I certainly sent him a copy, and I tried to interview him, but I think it, it, it was fairly late in the game, and uh, I did talk to a lot of people who worked with him and who were on the National Security Council under him. I spent a lot of time with Gary Sick, uh, and, uh, but no, I, I wish I had been able to. I, I also think at his level, 
he's not going to get all the, you know, the, the, some of these secret meetings uh, have, you know, you sort of have, to, for me, some of the breaks are with meeting Bill Casey's operatives and understanding that even before the hostage crisis, Casey had an intelligence network. And, and it was something that, that wasn't immediately apparent. Casey was a huge figure in intelligence during World War II in the Office of Strategic Services, but he was not in the CIA until he became CIA director in 1981. So people are saying, what did he, he was a lawyer, Who, what was he doing? No, he really was wired and he was working it. Uh, and he was working Israeli intelligence as soon as the Shah was toppled. And I also wanted to ask, just given your background covering this story, I know you said you were employed for a couple of years because of the lawsuit, the conspiracy theorist label, getting fired. But as sort of more time passed and you continued working on this, what were the implications of some of that blowback and, and how did some of that blowback evolve over time? Uh, well, the dust settled, I think. I, I, I also began to realize... Uh, you know, I, I sort of, it, it took me forever to figure out who Ari ben Manasi was. And, and uh, to be honest, I, I, I think there were at least two types of uh, disinformation. I think there was disinformation sent out by Israel to blow up in people's faces and discredit them. And uh, I think there were some, pe some of the people who, you know, there were three or four pilots who piloted supersonic jets and supposedly made these secret flights. And it was very hard to ferret out who was telling the truth and who wasn't. Uh, but gradually, I could wipe away the dust. And I, to me, a, a big uh, turning point in uh, restarting the project came in 2016. And I'd flown to France, and I, I went out to uh, Versailles. And uh, President uh, Bani Sadr, who had been the president of Iran, lived in France in exile. And when we talked about it, I, I had to talk through an interpreter, obviously, but you realize it was sort of a double coup d'etat in a way, that not only was Carter's presidency or re-election campaign sabotaged, but so in Iran was President Bani Sadr's. And, uh, and for him, it was even worse. He survived uh, three assassination attempts and finally <laughs> uh, realized he should get out of jail get out of Dodge and settle in Paris and where he lived in exile for the rest of his life. And when I was interviewing him, it was 2016, which is 36 years after the October surprise. Uh, and I, I, at, at the end of it, I said, you know, do you really think anyone still cares? Does it still matter at all? And he said, you have to do it. Otherwise, it'll happen again. Yeah. And of course, uh, three weeks later, Donald Trump was elected and uh, which meant I shelved the process and did two books on Trump but before going back to it. Just seen. And since you did those two books on Trump, then you really you really have seen, I imagine, the parallels between I mean when you talk about seeing the parallels between Trump and this, you've really got the research to back that up. Right. But I mean Trump is is you know, by contrast, Bill Casey didn't talk about Arnold Palmer's genitalia. Uh. You know, it was he, but he knew what he was doing, and he was very uh, uh, strategic in what in the way he operated. Uh, he, uh, you know, he evolved, He put forth multiple alibis uh, for his presence during these October surprise meetings, and I, I punctured one of them. I think Bob Perry punctured three of them, and finally. Uh, uh, Bob uncovered this memo that had been in the Bush administration, in the, in the, uh, the State Department, saying uh, uh, Bill Casey was in Madrid for reasons unknown. Yeah. And that was kind of the clear signal then that he was actually having these meetings, having these discussions, and that this wasn't some sort of coincidence. Absolutely. We have a question on Trump. Trump has said, I will have a Ukraine deal done before my first day in office. Uh, two questions here. Number one, why do you think this isn't covered more? And number two, is this illegal? If so, who has jurisdiction? Well, you know, I'm not a lawyer, but I mean, this is, 
supposedly the Logan Act is often cited. I'm not a lawyer, by the way, uh, but it's, you know, I don't think it's ever been applied in these circumstances, but I think it should. And I think we have to have not just oversight, but real accountability, and people have to be held to the fire about it. And yes, I mean, when, when Trump says he will end the, Viet, the, the uh, Ukrainian war, uh, what he means is he'll cave to Putin. He'll give Putin everything he wants. And I, I think that's absolutely clear. I don't know anyone, if anyone can contradict it, please do. Um, but, and he, can can talk, I ask a point of clarification sure. on that? Because it seems to me, even if Trump says to Putin, I will give you everything you want, uh, Vladimir Zelensky seems prepared to continue to fight as long as he feels he needs to. Well, that may well be true, but but Trump would would cut off the weapons. I mean, you know, I mean that's hugely important sure. to Ukraine's fight. If he does it without American support, that puts all the onus on Europe, and it's gonna it's gonna split up our uh, our alliance. I mean, the, NATO was in tatters by the end of Trump's first term. Uh, you know, I think one of uh, President Biden's great achievements is. He quickly repaired the damage. He did it very, very quickly. Uh, but uh, there's no question in my mind that the Atlantic Alliance would shatter if Trump became president. We also had another question, and, and I think maybe you can add some additional context to the answer here. But why did the Iranians agree to release the hostages after the election? What was in it for them? I mean, from my understanding, it was weapons, parts of weapons, but maybe you can even go a little broader on why that was so important for them at that moment. Well, this arms channel continued. It didn't just stop the moment Reagan was elected. And uh, so it wasn't just like one and done. No. And there were geostrategic reasons to arm Iran. We, I mean, I, I don't think anyone in the West wanted Saddam to conquer Iran. That was not in our interest. Um, but uh, I mean, what's sort of extraordinary, too, if you go back to 1980, and remember, uh, at the time, the Iranians were chanting death to America. They called America the great Satan and Israel the little Satan. And the Republicans were making jokes about how uh, uh, Reagan would bomb Iran to smithereens. The joke was, what, what's flat and red and glows in the dark? Huh. And the answer was... You know, Iran five minutes after Reagan is is, is inaugurated, um, and ex in fact, exactly the opposite uh, was taking place. Uh, the Reagan campaign was arming Iran. Um, I also want to see if you sort of just from your work have any advice for reporters as we head into this final October of our twenty twenty four election, as far as things to be aware of. Um, sort of who to trust, how to make sure that you're following good journalism ethics in a world of misinformation. Well, the other thing that, that I found kind of disgraceful in all this was access journalism. And when I was at Newsweek, I saw that happening again and again. I know Bob Perry went through this well. He was at Newsweek as well. But uh, another uh, Newsweek contributor when I was there was a guy named Henry Kissinger. Huh. Huh. And I think he had more clout than I did. So, you know, we were working uphill to get over that. And what you realized, even though the Washington Com uh, Post Company, which owned Newsweek, you know, had done Watergate and they'd had this uh, terrific success when they had a real adversarial, uh, honest adversarial relationship with the Nixon administration, uh, during the Reagan years, things changed. And I think people, a lot of reporters, uh, fell prey to the glamour of the Reagan administration. They liked hanging out that way. I, you know, when I was in my early career, one of my mentors was a late, great uh, journalist, I. F. Stone. And uh, when I was around 23 or so, I was I was in Washington. I, I was talking to him. I'd have breakfast with him once a week, and I told him I was uh, going to a party and I was going to see. I think it was Senator Senator Teddy Kennedy back then. He said, "No, you're not." You start hanging out with them, you're going to be carrying water for them. Huh. And uh, you know the truth is, uh, I, I think uh, it, it's all about to bring it up to today. It's about access, mm -hmm. and too many reporters want access to Trump, and they pull their punches mm -hmm. as a result. And if you don't pull your punches, you're never going to get to see him again. And people know that. I mean, it's sort of an unspoken relationship. 
the, the truth is your sources can be more valuable to you in pure monetary terms than your employer. And if you're in Trump's pocket or Putin's or, or uh, Henry Kissinger's, you, you know, that's uh, access is the coin of the realm to many journalists, especially. And I'm not a Washington reporter, by the way, and it's one reason I've sort of kept my distance from that one. And you know, I mean, that is, is the coin of the realm, and so is a lot of the times the breaking news, the scoop, anything you can put a little siren next to when you tweet it out. Right. Um, I know we have a time for a couple more questions. I know if you guys want to hand any to Madison, if you just want to like raise them up in the air, um, and that way she can come around and collect them. Um, we've got one. To paraphrase Howard Baker from a different perspective, what did Ronald Reagan know about Bill Casey's work in the campaign, and when did he know it? Well, you know, I can't give the definitive answer to that question. There was one time when Reagan uh, was asked about it. I mean, he really kept his distance from reporters with regard to this, but he was caught on the tarmac of an air, uh, uh, airport once, and, and a reporter shouted the question, and Reagan, as he was going away, shouted, oh, we did something the opposite way, whatever that means. That, I mean, one, one thing that suggests he was knowledgeable was, um, you, you know, there was a report in the New York Times last year that John Conley, the former governor of Texas, mm -hmm. and one time, he was a Democratic governor, but he ran as, uh, for the presidency as a Republican, and he wanted desperately to be in Reagan's cabinet. So the Times reported this, that, that Conley traveled uh, with his friend Ben Barnes, who had been lieutenant governor of Texas, throughout the Middle East in the summer of 1980. Turns out, they were on a mission for Bill Casey. And uh, I have a photo in the book of Ben Barnes and John Connolly with President, uh, Egyptian President Anwar Sadat uh, on this mission for Casey, at which they are telling all the leaders in the Middle East, you got to make sure Iran holds on to those hostages and doesn't release them till after the election. Um, well, Nancy Reagan knew about this, and there was a letter in the, uh, 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 I, I believe it was in the Reagan Library, in which uh, John Connolly wrote Nancy Reagan about it, and it suggests that Reagan, I mean, assuming Nancy talked to her husband, that Reagan may well have known about it. Did you ever talk with the families of the, or the hostages themselves about what it meant for them to be held this additional amount of time for political purposes? Well, a man named John Limbert was a hostage, and, and uh, he, had, he just attended my book party, so I was able to meet him for the first time last week. And I did an interview by phone earlier on, and uh, he, uh, uh, he married an Iranian woman. Uh, and uh, when the hostages were released, they first flew to Germany, and then I believe they landed at Stewart Air Base near West Point. And when he arrived, his wife greeted him, and the first thing she told him was, you know, they kept you longer than you had to stay, and they made a secret, the Republicans made a secret deal. So she heard about it through back channels from the Iranians, really. Uh, and, and that's one reason I did go to Iran was, to, I, I talked to, uh, interview the arms procurement officers there and several Iranians. I, and I just got a wonderful uh, letter from another hostage and I just, uh, a couple of hours ago really saying uh, how pleased he was to see the truth was finally revealed. Well, I think that that's a good spot. We've got one more question, but before we get to that, I did want to just sort of wrap this event um, by taking a moment to thank the headliners, co-team leaders, Donna Lyman Legere, Lori Russo, Jen Judson, as well as headline members, Joe Lucha, who put together today's event. Thank you so much. Uh, club membership director, Kate Helster, Pro club program manager, Cecily Scott Martin, and club executive director, DBA Soji. Uh, we also, of course, Craig, we always appreciate you sharing your insights with us. I believe <coughs> I'm supposed to have a mug to give you at this point. Oh, wonderful. Um, but we're going to get that mug for you. This is probably also a good time to note that we, uh, unfortunately, due to a uh, shipping delay, 
We don't have the books uh, this evening for sale. However, we do have a form out there, and if you sign the form, if you put down your address, you can buy a book and it will be shipped to you. And of course, Craig will be signing little slips that will then go into the book. So it's basically like a signed book. It is a signed book. It's just going to take a minute to get there. So we apologies for that, but we still do have that there. Um, and then again, just thank you to our audience for being here today. Uh, we hope you will join us on October 29th when we welcome Veteran Affairs Secretary Dennis McDonough, who will deliver an update of the State of Americans veterans and their family at the National Press Club Headliners Breakfast. And now we have the mug. Uh, this has been awarded to superstars, to diplomats, to rulers, to very influential people. And Craig, we think it, it belongs with you as well. So thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.